23. Have you been here before, Paul? On this site, but not necessarily this track. Hmm. This was the site where we... We got lost, yes. Yeah. So I wondered if you'd been this bit. Okay. No, the steep bit was right at the start. This is obviously steeper. <laughs> it's uphill. Hold on, just wait a sec. Oh no, it switched off. Yeah. You all right on this or do you want me to come up with you? Right. Okay. Yeah. You all right there? Okay. How's Mary? Good trip up? Yeah, not bad. Yeah. Great. Sorry? Yes. Yeah. is the fact that we have a sand, limestone, clay compacted together to form different types of soil structure throughout the hill, which means it's a very rare combination. Through the middle we have a mixture of sand going right around the big horseshoe called Holford sand, particularly good for making glass apparently. Also, um, because the sand's there, we're, in a, we're managing a heather restoration project that banks sort of over yonder there where those water tanks are. That's an enclosed heather area, it's been done for the last 20 years, it's, it's growing well. We're now doing the electric fenced heather area, just by the way those sheep are, electric fence posts over, over yonder. We go with, our, our conservation officer, Ellie, is trying to make it, to recreate this horseshoe of heather. But again, it's a very rare for the Cotswolds, a very rare for the limestone area. Also at the top here we have a dew pond, which is going to go up to in a, to in a minute. Back in the old times, before you had railways, you had to drive your, your livestock between towns and villages everywhere else. This was a major crossroads for all the drovers' roads. So you had a dew pond at the top here, and you would stop over to, to, to rest your stock overnight for a couple of days, whatever. And then we close paddocks on the far side where you put your stock in and there's water. Take the dew pond with the water. Be quiet. Four major Dakota roads going to Oxford, Cheltenham, so Gloucester, back to Tuxbury, and back to Stonewall that way. So it's a major, major crossroads at that time, it's a high of industry. And of course, the landowner at the time would get some money in as you would come through to for your sheep and cattle, as well as taxes mm -hmm. at that time. And then in 18, I believe 1830, Charlton Racecourse was here on the top of the hill here. Oh, there was a three story grandstand up just up, up in front of the mast there. There was just a mound of stuff there now where it, where it was burnt down. And we got records showing that at that time there was 30,000 people here for a whole week for the races. At that time it was kind of a fair, there was tinkers, travellers, you name it. Everybody came to this horse racing fair, show, whatever you want to call it. And around about 1845, I believe, the Bishop of Cheltenham decided it was too a bawdy place to be, so he moved this whole race course down to Cheltenham from off the hill to keep, keep it under, under his control. Hence where that's where the race course is now. And um, around about 1890, all the farmers got up in arms, the people got in arms, because the common was just left to do People were trying to graze it with animals of all sorts here, people were trying to do horse riding, galloping, racing, you name it. So in 1890, an Act of Parliament was set up that the Board of Conservators would take over running the common, as opposed to the landowner. And that's how it's working today, for exactly the same reasons as we have had today, to manage the, the land for conservation purposes, for, for leisure, for livestock, and trying to be balanced between all of it. It's my job as, as the, the senior ranger to keep that balance working today. Of course, more, more people have more interest today than they did 100 years ago. There's people want to put their cars, bikes, kites, dogs, name it, you name it. I have to keep, have to try and keep a balance. So now we try and have um, conference with all the big groups, like cyclist groups, we have a cycling code, we have a horse code, a dog code, kite flyers on the top here. All, we try and make everybody understand what they're here for and that we have control, but they have to self-police themselves. And on the whole, it works. By making people responsible for their for their particular job, it works really well. 
So and my job is again to keep an overall picture to make sure they all look after their own space and don't do any mischief. But on the whole, most people are, people are fairly good at doing that. And um, also on the hill we have the ancient monuments, so about the hill fort, the, the rings, the, the cross dike, all archaeological features which are triple SI listed, which I have to make sure are not damaged or abused. Which means keeping the gorse cut off, trying to keep people from riding motorbikes over or, or bikes, leaving these things over it, to keep the um, keep the grass intact so that it doesn't get, get it, it eaten away and washed away with the rain, etc. Also, the encroachment since um, farming has changed over the last 70 80 years, Going back in to our old records of 1890 to early 20s, there would be 5,000 sheep at this time of year, 500 pit ponies, and 300 cattle. Mm -hmm. This whole hill would be complete grass, just less than we have underneath our feet now. Mm -hmm. That was overgrazed, and over the last 70 years, it's got less and less and less. So now, unless we invite these sheep on, you see, wandering around here now, they wouldn't be in the grass at all. And Natural England came along to me 10 years ago and said, We'll have some cattle here because farmers don't put cattle on here no more because of the TV regulations. So we have our own cattle. To try and eat the grass down and keep the control. And also to cut this gorse back for all these trees and growth. Because when I started 10 years ago, this was solid, went the way across the hill there. You couldn't even walk through it hardly, let alone opened up. And first of all, naturally, we said, could we take out a whole area of gorse? All well, the far side, I've got 110 acres, completely cleared it back to what we have here now. And then they came back and they said, uh, perhaps we do mosaic cutting with the rest of it. So now we cut round, as you can see, like, like a mosaic cut all the way across the hill and we have a conservation officer Ellie who's extremely good at her job at doing wild plants wild flowers etc and she'll come to me later in the year and say can we look after this area or that area or clear that bit more gorse there or take that tree out there to try and find a balance between the gorse which now has its own habitat its own sort of things that that live in it which which are different to what, what the other rest of it is so it's a constant change in equation we have to work, work together with her natural england and, and we have a bug man, a bird man, a reptile guy as well comes up. We all work together. If you find some rare bugs in one area or some rare re reptiles, you say, look, if you regard that area, don't touch that tree or don't touch that bush. It's my job then to make sure we don't give out with, with a tractor. I, I go around with something, something like that. So it's a constantly changing sort of list of work to do. But also, we are winning because when I started naturally, they give you a, a survey, a list of what they call um, the ground that's uh, favourable and not favourable or in need of repair. When I started it was divided into seven segments and only one was favourable. Well the last last one that came was three years ago, they are all favourable, so we are winning, but we have to keep on top of it. If we don't keep on top of it, it will disappear back in the gorse again in about 10 or 20 years. So it's a very much of a managed environment, even though it's sort of countryside. It doesn't stay like it is unless it's managed, this particular area. And uh, <coughs> a little useful thing, when the cattle first come up here, 10 years ago, I had to bows of water to them. And that was a thousand gallons a day I was hauling this time of year, just to keep them happy. Anyway, not long after, 20, I think by 2009, 2008, a lady from the EU <coughs> came across and said, you've got, got some money to spend, what would you like? And I said, I've got some water on the hill. She said, no, what would you really like? I said, a pipe running through the hill, I can have water pipes off everywhere so I can feed the cattle wherever I want to. How much? How much? They gave us a price, one the price, four hundred thousand pounds. They gave us. We now have six miles of pipe through here, another three miles on the other side. We've got water anywhere you want on the hill now, which means we can target graze because cattle are lazy beasts. So they've got food and water, they won't go far. So we've got water tanks over there, they won't go far. That's why I want them to eat that bank off over there. So that's where they're going to stay because that's where they've got food and water. And if they want to come back down here, I'll put the water tank over here somewhere, and they can come down here. And so it's working really well. All these projects are ongoing, they don't stay still, we have to keep looking at all the time, as I said before. Uh, I think that's covered basically what we, we do at the moment. Brilliant. Thank you. Right.
Okay, I'm behind you. No, I'm not going up it. I'm just waiting. Uh, well, if you go up that side, that's less steep. And I'm right behind you. So it can't go, can't go back. Okay? Go for it. Excellent. Yeah. Do we break then? Do we 